Meet Mr. Mittal. This video is in response to questions from viewers after my last video on productivity in Indian industry. It's relatively quickly produced just to respond to yesterday's comments. One comment by someone called Volti. They said, in most countries, the national capitalist class is extremely limited or non-existent. Well, I was talking about India. India has the third largest number of billionaires in any country of the world. That's not a, a small or non-existent national capitalist class. Look at Mr. Mittal, for example. Mr. Mittal is the Indian steel billionaire who was the world's richest man in 2005. He's slipped a bit in the ranks since then, but still not a figure to be sneezed at. In addition to his Indian steel works, Mittal owns a large part of the US steel industry. He owns Bethlehem Steel, ISG Weirden Steel, LTV Steel in Cleveland, Republic Steel, Jones and Lachlan Steel, and Acme Steel in Chicago. So when I was giving comparisons between workers employed in India in the steel industry and workers employed in the US in the steel industry, in the main, they were employed by the same boss. And in this case, it was an Indian capitalist who was employing them. Peter said, why do certain industries get exported to underdeveloped countries if differences in wage rate are basically explained by differences in productivity? Well, wages are not basically explained by productivity in that particular industry. Wages are regulated by the Reserve Army of Labour. And the most important such Reserve Army is what Marx calls the Latent Reserve Army, basically the reserve of poor peasants. In a country where there's a large impoverished peasant class, urban wages are constantly held down by competition with country folk migrating to the towns. So in these circumstances, peasants and landless labourers will be willing to move provided the urban wages are slightly above the rural misery they face. Thus the low productivity in peasant agriculture is the ultimate regulator of wages in these circumstances. But generally, low levels of wages which result from this mean that even in a more advanced sector, like the steel production in India, it doesn't pay Mr. Mittal, the, the steel billionaire, to invest in such capital intensive methods in his Indian factories as he does in the ones he owns in the USA. And this means that his Indian factories have lower labour productivity than his US ones. Truong said, another point which I don't agree is that the examples you mentioned show that productivity is in India is lower compared to the US, which is intuitively obvious. But from that you conclude there's no unequal exchange. But if you look more carefully, you will see that the higher productivity is usually due, surprise surprise, to the higher amount of expended capital. So because the US has more capital, they can invest more, leading to better machinery, leading to higher productivity, leading to higher profit. Does this sound like Marx's transformation of commodity value into prices of production? Frankly, no it doesn't. This is a misunderstanding of the level of abstraction at which Marx's transformation theory applies. His transformation theory applies to the relative prices of different commodities, not different producers of the same commodity. Thus, if the silicon fabrication industry in the USA run by companies like Intel, had a higher organic composition of capital than the steel industry, then Marx's theory would predict that the products of the silicon industry would sell at a slightly higher price relative to their labour value than the products of the steel industry. But when we're dealing with different suppliers of the same product, the product, whether in the examples I gave before, were ingot steel and rice, then there is only a single price for the product. Whoever makes it, it's sold at the same price. And the relevant sections of capital you should be studying for this is not volume three, but 
volume two, volume one, the section on machinery and modern industry. And here he shows that labour in less productive firms or less productive factories counts as less than a full hour for each hour performed in inverse proportion to their productivity. Now, a couple of posts from a guy pass or woman passing themselves off as Zulu DFA. First post, before I brought out yesterday's video, of course American steel worker is more productive. It's easy to be more productive when half or so of your value added was already added by your dad 30 years ago. And I, how can I put this in more simple terms? Well, in the subsequent video I showed that the value added per ton is very close in the two methods of producing steel using scrap steel or using raw materials. Here's a detailed account of what I showed yesterday as a reminder. So if you look at the two ba basic ways of making steel in the USA, arc furnaces or basic oxygen furnaces, I showed what the raw material costs per tonne of output were. For arc furnaces 281, for basic oxygen 263. Whichever process you use, it has to sell at the current going price of a ton of steel, which is around $480. So that the added value in arc furnace plants would be around 198, and the added value in basic oxygen ones, 217, a bit lower than that actually, if you start taking into account oxygen costs, which are around $17 a ton. So the added value ends up as being almost identical in the two cases. So his claim that the reason why US workers were more productive is value added by their, their dads 30 years ago was being passed through. This is just doesn't fit into the facts at all. Having seen that, he then bit backtracks. He says, to counter my assertion that scrap raw material increases production, he shows that it costs more or even slightly more per tonne than steel product, but this doesn't matter because it takes longer to smelt the ore and imbue it with carbon than to basically just remould what was already steel since the last time it got produced. You don't try and imbue the ore with carbon, but never mind. Voila, here is the increased productivity in terms of physical use values and diminished productivity in terms of new labour per unit output. Well, what he's done he's shifted from a confused claim about a higher proportion of the final value being made of constant capital to a quite different claim. He's now saying that the electric arc steel process is physically more productive in terms of labour hours expended per tonne of output. Fine, that's what I was originally saying. He's endorsing what I originally said, that one year of US steel workers' time produces more tonnes of steel than in India. That's to say, physical productivity is higher in the US due to the use of more modern techniques. Whether the labour saving that does this is due to using an arc, a more modern arc furnace or whether it's using more modern basic oxygen furnaces makes no difference. The actual productivity per hour is higher in the US than it is in India by a very large margin. Part of that may be using electric arc furnaces, but in general it will be the use of more modern techniques or more capital intensive techniques across the board. So he's gone around in a complete circle from initially claiming that I hadn't taken into account value added to now saying conceding my original point. Okay, does a number of other things being raised in comments. People are asking things to me about um, dialectics. I'm getting questions about whether I think uh, Lenin's theory of imperialism as capital export is still valid. Um, I think some of the things I've said in this may cause you to think twice about that because if it's the case that Indian capitalists 
are owners of a large part of the US steel industry. You have to ask where is the capital export flowing from and to? And how does this coincide with what you normally think of as imperialism? But we will stop here and I'll have to think what new videos to produce.